Broadcasting live from our studio in Boston, Solutions Review is proud to showcase Cloudflare in the Solutions Spotlight, a unique online event for industry professionals. I'm Doug Atkinson here at Solutions Review and welcome to the Solutions Spotlight featuring Cloudflare and focused on the economics of DDoS protection. Every week it seems, our cybersecurity coverage includes another distributed denial of service attack on an unsuspecting organization. In today's hyper-connected digital landscape, enterprises face a persistent threat from DDoS attacks. These attacks disrupt critical services, impair customer experiences, and inflict significant financial losses, making DDoS protection an indispensable aspect of modern cybersecurity strategies. So today, we're shining our spotlight on Cloudflare, one of the leading network and data security solutions available. Amazingly, they block an average of 140 billion threats per day, including some of the largest DDoS attacks ever recorded. We've organized this event to help explain the profound impact DDoS attacks can have on an organization's bottom line and how investing in proactive defenses can yield substantial returns. And joining us to walk you through the Cloudflare solution is Senior Product Marketing Manager, Kimberly Biddings. Kim, thanks for being with us. Great, hi Doug, thanks for having me. I'm so excited to be here today. I, I really appreciate the time. So I've been in cybersecurity, uh, oh gosh, going on 15 years now, um, recently joined Cloudflare. And one of the things that really stuck out to me after so many years in the industry is how we approach security, how we approach specifically DDoS protection. And so I'm so excited to be here today to talk to you exactly about that, but also about some math, right? Some economic impact of these attacks. Um, so first I wanna kind of dive in, go through what we'll talk about today at a high level, um, but everywhere security we'll start with, we'll talk about why DDoS protection matters, what these attacks are potentially costing you. Uh, again, a little math for anybody that's out there ready to crunch some numbers. Um, some of the economic impact of DDoS protection, doing it a different way, and then we'll open it up for some, some Q&A and some interactive points along the way. All right. So first, everywhere security. Uh, it's really important to think about how much we've changed, how much your world has changed over less than 10 years, right? If we're looking at 2016, 2018, right? Going back, going back before COVID, uh, before the pandemic kind of changed a lot, obviously, things were relatively less complicated, right? We had some remote users, some office users, mostly corporate devices. Um, for the most part, we had our own data centers, some cloud was coming in, um, and the tech stack was relatively simple. However, as we start moving forward and looking into 2019, 2021, and now as we go into 2022 and beyond, things are a lot more complicated, right? The business is expanding, the business is going everywhere. And so you have a hybrid work situation, right? You have multiple clouds, you have SaaS, you have the public internet, you have on-prem apps, data centers, and then you have devices, IoT, personal devices, corporate devices. And underneath that is just this really complicated tech stack. And a lot of what's happening is the solutions that used to get you where you need to go are not what's going to get you where you're going tomorrow. And so what we're seeing is just this complicated web or what I usually affectionately call this patchwork quilt of technology. And what it's doing is essentially a couple different challenges we'll talk about, but ultimately it's bloating up your attack surface, right? There's a lot of integration points when you look at this picture, there's a lot of disparate solutions being connected. I love the dotted lines showing that kind of connected uh, network, but not totally. Um, and again, that just allows for risk. When we talk about how many solutions some of you have, the average that I've seen out, out there is about 130 or more solutions for security alone when you're looking at an enterprise. IBM and Ponemon did a really interesting study back in 2020 that actually took a look at the impact of having too many solutions. And, and what they found is that if you have 50 or more solutions, which many organizations do, it actually impacts your ability to A, detect an attack, right? Some companies are reporting an 8% decrease in their ability to detect attacks. And then being able to respond effectively where they actually saw a 7% decline in their ability to respond. So again, I love to ask the question, is it harder to actually respond to the cyber attacks or is it just trying to get all these security solutions to work together? 
So we're going to go into three core challenges that are really going to highlight what these complexity issues are, but as well as the risk. And the three core challenges that I look at in this situation is the first one, attacks are everywhere. We're going to focus in today on one specific attack, specifically around network attacks. But with your business going everywhere, attacks are coming in from everywhere. They're going after your network, your applications, your employees, your customers, right? They're really coming in from all sides because of that expanding surface. The second challenge is how much time your team may be spending on manual tasks, on managing this infrastructure, on trying to coordinate across solutions. I just recently talked to a customer and they're managing 66 dashboards. 66. It's like trying to organize across that many interfaces, not to mention the overhead of training a team member to get familiar with all of those dashboards effectively. So again, there's just this massive amount of complexity. And then the third challenge is one I don't think we talk about enough, and that's that false efficiency. This is really coming in when you hear the word platform, right? In many cases, a security platform, if you go under the hood, is really a collection of disparate services and solutions, maybe by acquisition, maybe by development, bolting things together. But again, what that creates, because they are disparate behind the scenes, is this ability to introduce latency, right? Latency into the customer experience, latency into your employee experience, and that can actually directly impact your revenue and even your employee attrition rate. So again, three core challenges that's really being caused by this plethora of attacks and the complexity of how we're approaching this today. So what I want you to keep in mind is what if you could achieve true simplicity and agility for your business? And we'll talk about that, achieving that with a fundamentally integrated approach one which has security services running as much on a single network fabric. It has shared threat intelligence and it's easy to manage, especially at that foundational technology level. So we're going to talk about that approach. Um, but today, you know, we have to start a little bit, of course, with where we are. And we're going to start first by why are we digging into this one type of attack? Why are we digging in specifically to DDoS attacks and what are we seeing in terms of trying to block or protect against those. So first, you know, I want to reiterate your goal, right? Most likely you're out there and what you're trying to do is protect yourself and your business from these attacks, but without introducing any type of performance or latency impact and really trying to overall reduce the impact of any attack on your business. But what we're seeing and from as Doug mentioned, just the amount of volume of attacks that we see every day, that DDoS attacks are truly just increasing. Now, for anybody out there that's tuning in is not as familiar with a DDoS attack, um, it is a distributed denial of service attack, and its core purpose is to disrupt, right? Whether that's a website, an internet property, a network, server, what it's trying to do is essentially give as much traffic to that source as possible and essentially render it unavailable for legitimate users. So overwhelmed with traffic, it's almost like that driver getting stuck in traffic on the way to the grocery store, right? It's hard to get to that, that asset. So what are we seeing from trends in terms of the volume of attacks? And unfortunately, as of Q2 2023, when we did our latest DDoS threat report, they're only increasing. So we're seeing attacks in terms of the duration of attack uh, in three hours. They're increasing by 103% quarter over quarter. Top three industries being targeted by hacktivist alliances, right? We have to remember we're up against professional criminals now, um, are software, gambling and casinos and gaming, right? We've even seen recently uh, attacks against, let's say, MGM, right, in Las Vegas uh, in, in the United States. That's been a very common application type DDoS attack that's been making the news. We're also seeing DDoS for hire groups. We've seen that a lot in ransomware as a service, right? These groups that you can hire to then go uh, actually execute an attack, they're as little as $10 for them to actually do a DDoS attack against a certain uh, internet property. And then finally, we've seen certain vulnerabilities just spike in terms of being taken advantage of. And we saw that with a 532% surge in DDoS attacks going after that Starblast Mitel vulnerability that most of you know about. So again, attacks are increasing. 
But I think it's also important for us to talk about what types of attacks we're really focused on, especially with today's conversation. So DDoS attacks happen at multiple layers across the OSI model. Layer seven is the one that most people think about, is more popular, probably makes the news the most because that's the application layer. And that's when somebody's website goes down, you can no longer get to MGM to book, let's say a hotel room. Those are gonna have very public facing uh, impacts and immediate um, news headlines if you think about it that way. But just as malicious and just as damaging can be the layer three and four attacks or what we look, look at as attacks that target network software that the computer is actually running on instead of any type of specific port. And these are going after protocols usually to conduct attacks. For example, the ICMP protocol is commonly used to flood a server. Um, and that's using something like too many pings or too large of a ping that's going to essentially crash that device. So again, a lot of these are meant to be disruptive. In the attacks that we're focused on today on layer three, layer four, these are really going after those network software or our network attacks. Okay. So how are you all approaching it today? What's, what's the challenge with the approach today that many organizations are taking? And what we're seeing is really this flawed approach about running traffic, right? Whether on demand, if they're seeing malicious uh, traffic, a potential attack, or this always on concept, but it's running traffic through these scrubbing centers, whether that's in the cloud or hardware appliances, and immediately it's creating limitations, right? Not only in terms of latency, but each actual approach has its own limitations. For on-demand, we're looking at delayed attack response, right? If that traffic's not indicated as an attack right away, there could be a delay there allowing that attack to occur. Increased cost is another issue and just potentially missing attacks altogether could also pose a lot of concern. Now, when we look at the always on component, it definitely is all about that latency problem, right? So we're looking at going through the scrubbing centers, how much latency is that actually causing that negatively impacts user experiences? And we'll talk about that there's actually dollar value tied to impacting those experiences. And then overall, just higher network capacity. To do that, you have higher bandwidth costs, higher utilization costs. And again, it's just going to increase costs, continuously protect against DDoS attacks. So again, both approaches are somewhat flawed and posing some limitations. So with these approaches, what are we seeing customers struggle with the most? Well, here are some things. We've already covered some of these but we'll kind of go through them again. So when you have the wrong approach to DDoS protection, one clear thing is a gap in security and also lack of visibility. And most of that is caused by these point solutions, disparate views, not being able to cohesively see the full risk landscape and being able to see where an attacks are occurring. The second one we've talked about is latency, right? Impacting productivity for your internal teams and customer experiences. You can't keep up with the latest threats. How can you possibly keep up if you don't have a broader perspective of the threats that are out there? Um, and then time is really just wasted, right? We talked about that scattered approach, trying to go across multiple interfaces. It's wasting teams time trying to chase down these attacks. All right, so we're gonna open it up. A uh, little interactive time for us today is a nice poll question. Um, so I know Doug, you're out there, you're helping set this up for us. Um, poll question is, what is your biggest obstacle to effectively respond to DDoS attacks today? So people in staffing, technology, priorities, a lack of process or a lack of budget. So for Zoom folks, you're gonna be able to directly answer this poll. For anybody on our LinkedIn Live or other platforms, please feel free to add your comments into the chat. Um, and Doug, I know we'll come back in just a few minutes to uh, go through those results, but everybody start getting your votes in. All right, so while we're collecting some of your responses, um, we are going to dive into, as promised, a little bit of the math. So what are these attacks actually costing us, right? What's the dollar impact that we're looking at from these attacks? And it's not what you would think in terms of just the straightforward cost, um, let's say of the risk reduction or the likelihood of attack, there are some other costs involved. Uh, but for now, Doug, I wanted to open it back up. 
Have we had any uh, poll responses? And if so, any feedback that you'd like to share with the audience? Uh, we do have some results from our first poll question, uh, and we've gotten a good uh, number of res responses. So the biggest obstacle, uh, actually ranking number one, uh, is lack of budget. Uh, uh, not, maybe not yeah. surprisingly. Nope. <laughs> uh, coming in number two, uh, and the numbers are changing as people continue to vote. This is good stuff. Nice. Uh, is uh, technology detection and mitigation tools. Again, I think that's um, consistent with what we've heard so far in your presentation. Yeah. People and staffing is number three. Okay. Uh, and then the uh, tied for uh, fourth is priorities and, uh, and the lack of process. Uh, so interesting, um, yeah. lots of votes. Um, and, and I think what it's basically saying is that you know this is a very timely event that we're doing right now in terms of uh, in terms of the cost and the uh, and the ROI that's that's uh, that's to be determined uh, based upon finding the right solutions. Uh, and I'll let you jump back into the presentation. We're going to be doing another poll question for sure uh, shortly. Sure. Thank you, Doug. And yeah, those those results are not surprising, right? And a lot of them are related. You know, you need budget to potentially get better technology. Um, to essentially staff or provide resources. Um, but what I'd like you to keep in mind is there definitely are ways to reduce your total cost of ownership, your overhead, to free up some of those budget dollars. We see that a lot in terms of consolidating some of these point solutions, reducing complexity down. Uh, that's where a lot of our customers find that budget that they need, often to actually invest more in processes and people than anything else. All right, so when we look at the cost of DDoS, there's some real true impact. And I didn't want it to be our word or my word, right? There's plenty of examples out there. Um, and so the first one you can see here is Overwatch 2 was hit by not one, but two DDoS attacks on launch day. Look, I've gone through some launch days and having two attacks in one day would not be the best launch experience. And unfortunately, that's what happened. People reported that the game wasn't available for as many as 12 hours. And as you can imagine, it was a big blow to revenue, reputation, and gamers are not the most forgiving customers, so definitely had an impact on their brand reputation. In 2021, the other one you can see here is that bandwidth.com was a really interesting example. Um, this is actually when DDoS attacks were targeting some of the VoIP providers uh, out there globally. They saw an impact to their Q3 revenue of $700,000 and their annual revenue of nearly $12 million due to the impact it had on the transaction volume and customer credits they had to issue. So incredible impact. Uh, remember these numbers as we get into our math, you'll see uh, I was much more conservative than 12 million, I can tell you that. Um, and then finally, I'm going back to 2007. I really like this example. Um, it reminds us of just how long these type of attacks or attacks in general have been happening. Estonia was considered one of the first countries hit by cyber attack and had real world consequences. They went after banks, media outlets, government bodies, um, and they, they really turned around since then. They've invested heavily in their cyber defenses and are now considered one of the most cyber secure countries in the world. So I think it's also a great example to show that you can turn around and put in the improvements you need to really improve security posture. Now, the other impact we've been talking about is not just the attack cost, but also that overhead that you have of this complexity, this dragging down on productivity. These are two Cloudflare customers that talked about what it was like before Cloudflare. You can see PacSun is a great example where they had DDoS mitigation vendor in place, and it ended up that they still had to manually triage and deal with some of the, the most uh, dangerous attacks, 20% of those actually. Right, so 20% of attacks were still coming through and hitting the team to manage on their own. The other customer, MindBody, is a great one in terms of the complexity of point solutions. And you can see here, right, it says we have a diversity of all of products of all different interfaces, different capabilities, different platforms across different things. Whew, that's exhausting, right? There's so many things to try to manage and monitor, and it's very, very difficult. So again, two examples right away in terms of customers that were able to reduce some of this complexity, but sharing what it was like before. Okay, I promised some math, right? So some back of the napkin math, 
I'm going to say back in the napkin because these are completely estimates. Um, and so please take it with a grain of salt. It does matter, of course, what industry you're in, what your org size is. But for the purposes, I think this gives a pretty good idea of what this could cost you. So there are three areas of cost. The first one that we're going to talk about is the attack itself. Um, and what I'm going to do for this purpose, you can see on the right hand side about the average, but let's see how that's built out. What would one three hour DDoS attack cost, hypothetically speaking? So the first thing we're going to do is look at the attack. So it's a duration of three hours, right? Um, and right now, the best benchmark I could find, it varies pretty widely because it's hard to get an exact cost estimate. But Ponemon Institute came out and said DDoS attacks average cost per minute of downtime was about $22,000. Okay, so if we take the 180 and multiply it out by those 22,000. One attack that's three hours long cost you about 3.96 million. Okay, so that's the first thing. That's the attack cost. Now we're going over to the productivity or the time it takes to respond. And amazingly, according to CrowdStrike's recent global security attitude survey, it's an average of 173 hours for each cyber incursion. And if you look, it breaks out 146 hours to detect it, 11 hours to understand it, and 16 hours to remediate it. I do find it interesting, 146 hours to detect it. I may say there's obviously some uh, correlation between having so many point solutions and trying to distinguish when an attack is happening. But we're going to look at also average salary of a security team member. This also would vary widely depending on your country, your region, your size, but we'll base it at about $150,000 annually. So one attack, 173 hours, you're looking at about $12,477. Now that is wildly underestimated because that's one person responding for the, that amount of hours. As we know, attacks usually take teams, business stakeholders, and other members of your company working together as well. So again, I would say that's very, very conservative. And then finally, the impact to customers. So looking at a, a recent statistic, 54% of customers said they would stop using a brand after one bad experience. And for example, you saw that $700,000 impact bandwidth.com had because they lost customer transaction credit. So this has a direct impact potentially on your revenue. So I took an example. Let's say you have 10 net new customers a year and they're each bringing in $50,000 of annual revenue. If you have a 54% of them that are impacted and could potentially leave your business, that means that about $270,000 is at risk. So when we look at one attack, just one attack, that's a conservative cost of about 4.24 million. And if you experience four attacks per year, you're looking at a $17 million overhead for your business. So again, 4.24 for one attack, about 17 million for four attacks. So again, very, very high. I would actually argue if you look at, let's say, bandwidth.com costs them 12 million. Um, I would think that that's actually relatively conservative. But for our next poll question, let's ask all of you, how does the estimated cost of that DDoS attack compare to what you have experienced? Is it spot on? You're saying, oh, cost us relatively the same. It's too high or it's too low or maybe you're just not sure, but are going to go crunch the numbers. So for our Zoom folks, please answer that directly in the Zoom interface. And then for anybody in live chat, please put some of your chat comments in. And then Doug will open it up to you uh, in just a moment to go through those results again. All right, so before we go back to the poll results, I uh, wanna go through the economic impact of DDoS protection. That's where we're headed next. I've shown you all the cost, I've shown you the complexity, the risk that's happening, but let's talk about how we actually go to a better approach and a different approach for DDoS protection that really should help with the ROI of any solution that you have in place. But for now, Doug, um, Looks like you're still calculating totals, so I'll keep going through the next slide and then I'll come back to you in just a, a few moments. All right, so economic impact of DDoS. It's really important before we get into what kind of impact this could have on the cost, that you understand the things that you need to look for in terms of taking a different approach to DDoS protection that can really handle the challenges of your business today. 
So these are the core elements you want to focus on. And actually, I'm going to pause. Doug, I can see you've joined me again. Um, but go ahead and let me know about any of the numbers that we've seen uh, from. Yeah, the I don't I don't want to break your flow. And I, and I feel like That's I've been okay. doing that, but I do have numbers uh, okay, and let's they're hear them. coming in. Um, I think unsurprisingly, again, um, in first place uh, is I'm not sure. Uh, and so the, uh, the, the, the questions were, um, you know, how, do you, how does the estimated cost of DDoS attacks compare to what you have experienced? And, and number one, by far and away, is I'm not sure. Uh, and okay. we'll go crunch the numbers. Number two is too high, which doesn't surprise me at all either. Um, mm -hmm. Because ultimately, I think what, we're, uh, what you demonstrated, Kim, is that these things are are uh, are legitimately you know hard money cost uh, and and can add up quickly uh, and and then tied again for the final two spots is spot on uh, and too low uh, and those are single digit percentages so um, okay. so ultimately uh, roughly eighty percent eighty six percent of uh, of Respondents are saying they're either not sure or that it's too high. Okay. Uh, so again, I think this is a, this is a good uh, example and and demonstration of why this presentation is so timely. I yeah, you know, I'm I'm thrilled with the results because it shows me two things, which is one, maybe we need to crunch some of these numbers, right? I think this is a really helpful exercise to think about the actual financial impact to the business. Um, by the way, it's really great for board slides. It's really great for making your case for additional budget and for more resource. Um, and then I think too high, what I would encourage you to think about is some of those softer costs, right, that we're talking about, the time savings, right, the reputational, the revenue impact. Um, I definitely agree. I think it'd be too high if you're not necessarily a high transaction or um, let's say online type of organization. But again, I would definitely have you consider and start thinking about some of these soft costs that we just don't factor into the actual impact of these attacks. But thank you, Doug, so much for, for helping aggregate those results. You bet. All right. So we'll jump back into what are we looking for then to help mitigate and take away some of these costs, right? So when we look at what we should look at for DDoS protection for now and into the future, Number one is, again, behind your solution, right? Behind your quote unquote platform, make sure that all services are running on a very highly performant global network. That's extremely important in terms of that performance, that latency, making sure that there is no impact to the user experience as you're mitigating these attacks, as well as just some tremendous visibility benefits when all of your services are connected and working in unison. Part of that is the automated threat intelligence, Again, I've seen that there's a study done out there that 96% of organizations said that if they could automate their cybersecurity programs, they could actually help alleviate that cybersecurity talent shortage that they've been facing. So again, going back to one of the challenges you all have with being able to prevent DDoS attacks as people and staffing, if you can automate a lot of this, we're taking away that time and productivity burden on them, allowing them to do more meaningful tasks and again, just being better at resource allocation. So really, really important to try to automate as much as possible. Along with that global network also comes shared threat intelligence. You wanna be connected and understand and have a solution that can see attacks before they're even coming. Know when the largest attacks are out there globally before it even gets to your network, before it gets to your users. I have this huge thing and it's that saying, right? If you can't see it, you can't manage it. I like, if you can't see it, you can't mitigate it. Um, again, it's really important in terms of visibility for reducing risk. And then services all manage from the same interface. Again, we just talked about time savings, trying to scatter across multiple interfaces. Um, it's really important that your team can use one interface and also that they don't need to be trained up on all types of solutions, but can manage it from the same experience. All right, so let's look at some of that math again, right? So again, we did a back of the napkin. This is now implementing something like Cloudflare DDoS. What impact would that have? So the first one, I couldn't say zero duration, although I'm very confident that our attack, our attack detection time is actually less than three minutes. 
Um, but I gave us a little bit of, okay, maybe this attack happened for a few more minutes. We have a 10 minute duration, but again, very, very low duration in terms of attack. When you take that, take that 22,000 per minute, you're now looking at $222,000. Now for the other statistics and the other math we're looking at, we went out and we actually surveyed our customers to say, what has been the impact on your DDoS attack protection when using this type of solution? When we look at the time that they spent, they were actually able to reduce the response time that their team had by up to 75%. So when we look at that 173, 174 hours and reduce it down by 75%, you're now looking at about $2,600 overhead for that one team member. In terms of the financial impact, our customers actually said that about up to 24% of improvement on customer retention rate could be seen by using a different approach such as Cloudflare. And so again, when we look at the, the metrics on that, we're reducing the revenue that's at risk and taking that down to about 140,000. So when you total all of that up, that's saving close to 3.9 million on one attack alone. On top of that, our customer said that 75% reduction in attacks is possible with Cloudflare. So you're looking at a $13 million savings if you reduce those four attacks by 75%. So overall, whether you've crunched your numbers or not, and again, this is a back of the napkin. This takes a very short amount of time to do. I highly encourage you to see how it adds up. See how it adds up to get the right DDoS protection in place and to really achieve the greatest savings for your business. Now that brings us over to kind of this last part of our talk for today is really, well, how do you do that? How are you achieving that? Um, what is our DDoS approach here at Cloudflare? And fundamentally, our overarching theme is really around everywhere security. We believe that because your workers, your applications, your infrastructure is everywhere, your business is everywhere, that your security really should be too. And that means that it has to be simple to secure. You have to be able to see more and protect more. And you have to have security for where you're going that's able to evolve, that's able to go with your business. And so you can see here from a security perspective, we think about protecting our employees, our applications, and like we're focused on today for DDoS, protecting our network or protecting our networks. So let's talk first about the, the back end, right? Behind, behind the scenes, be under the hood, right? What we've been talking about. This is not built on disparate technology or infrastructure. What really makes a lot of our DDoS protection and any of our everywhere security offerings hum is that they sit on this connected fabric and it's on our global network, right? Our network spans 300 plus different cities and we mitigate attacks out of any of those points of presence. So again, why is that so effective? That goes back to the fact that we mitigate attacks closest to their source. There's no backhauling of traffic or scrubbing or cleaning or hardware appliances that are going to fail. And so end users actually are none the wiser when attacks happen. It's that seamless and almost never impacts the user directly. And then second, because of that network, we have this tremendous amount of visibility. Our threat intelligence is based on the telemetry from millions of customer in over 300 locations. We use both machine learning as well as inferences from our ecosystem around us to really that, get that com comprehensive coverage against any internet-borne threats. And as Doug mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, we're blocking an average of 140 billion attacks per day before they even reach their destination. So again, very, very powerful when you have that global footprint and perspective to be able to block just a tremendous amount of attacks. And then third, because, of, because we talked about those pain points with, with point solutions, we're really focused on making sure that our platform consolidates all those services into a single easy to use UI. And it really removes any need for correlating events across platforms, training on multiple dashboards, and it just has a tremendous amount of time savings. As you saw before, 75% improvement in the response time for attacks. So again, a tremendous impact when you start building the foundation to a different approach. So to recap, in terms of specifically for DDoS protection, why do we stand out? 
again, that modern architecture that's fundamentally supporting it. All services are run at all points of presence. And so again, we're able to mitigate right where that attack is occurring. Comprehensive protection, again, time to mitigate, sorry, not three minutes, about less than three seconds. So my 10 minutes was a way overestimated uh, cost, let's say for an attack, but again, really quick mitigation um, and oftentimes very automated overall. And then completely easy to use. We talked about that, that single interface, that single point to be able to manage your security posture overall. Now, let's wrap up with a couple uh, comments from our customers. Um, I just love our Cloudflare customers. Uh, they have some of the best stories and are just really passionate about the impact that they've seen. Um, overall, when we asked uh, in a recent survey, 79% of them actually agreed that they do not have to worry about DDoS attacks thanks to using Cloudflare. Can you imagine, not only are you trying to block attacks and not have latency happen, but if you just don't have to worry about them. That's very, very powerful and our customers agree. And then lastly, I wanted to highlight this one customer that really stands out to me who um, is Megalayer. So they're a global telecom provider. Um, they had massive attacks take down their data center and result in network packet losses and outages. And the real uh, pinnacle attack, serious attack, was one where they had nonstop attack for seven days straight. Now, once they implemented Cloudflare's DDoS protection, these are some of the results that they saw. So four, over 4,000 attacks blocked in one week, 100% increase in their network availability and accessibility, 60% reduction in network maintenance, and 50% reduction in overall maintenance costs. You can see there that their CTO just said that communication was smooth, the whole configuration process was smooth, and Magic Transit, which is our DDoS solution, really allowed their resources to operate normally even when under attack. So very, very powerful outcome. And again, extremely quick to start experiencing some of these benefits and value of having the right DDoS protection in place. All right, so I'm gonna wrap up some key learning points. Uh, if you've been kind of tuning out, maybe watching some email, come back, listen up. You know, these are the three things to take away. So. First and foremost, DDoS protection in general is completely essential with how much we're seeing attacks and that persistent wave of attacks happening, and they're also growing in complexity and duration. Number two, risk and complexity increase as you start adding on point solutions, or please look out for that false efficiency claims with those platform plays. Um, you want to be aware of how much risk or complexity you have on your shoulders. And number three, evaluate moving to that unified platform that really is truly built and powered by that intelligent global network to, again, get some of these savings and the math that we talked about today. All right. Well, if you want to learn more, uh, please feel free to scan the QR code um, to request a demo. You can also go to cloudflare.com. We have some absolutely incredible 101 resources in our learning center to tell you all about DDoS attacks um, and start exploring some of our solutions. But want to thank everybody for tuning in. And Doug, I will turn it back to you for some questions from the audience. Yeah, great, Kim, thanks. Um, you, uh, in addition to being the senior product marketing manager at Cloudflare, you also list on your LinkedIn cybersecurity enthusiast. Yes. And, uh, <laughs> and I thought that was a pretty good indication, that presentation you gave right there of, uh, of your enthusiasm for the, for the solution. Yeah. And, <clears throat> And truth be told, I mean, uh, when when I did my introduction, I I, uh, I pointed out that you know there isn't a week that goes by here at Solutions Review where we're not covering some sort of cyber attack that is in the news. And honestly, those are the ones that make it out uh, into the public domain. Uh, there, uh, as you well articulated, there's just so many that n never nobody ever talks about. Um, right. And they, I'm curious, yeah. in addition to the cost savings, right? So, I mean, I, I, I totally get the math and, and I think most people recognize that, but I think a lot of people um, might, be, might be stuck in kind of the, the, their current environment or their current um, culture uh, mm -hmm. as to how to approach this thing. I, I'm curious if you could talk a little bit about how an organization can benefit from DDoS protection outside of cost savings? Sure, yeah, no, that's a good question. And 
You know, I think it goes back. And by the way, the, the statistic I ran across was about 29.3 attacks per day for an organization. So we're definitely not hearing about it. We hear about the the tip of the iceberg, right? Kind of that top percent um, of what's really going on out there. And when we look at cost savings, so cost saving oftentimes is thought of as a hard cost savings. And when I think about people looking at what other benefits do you get from DDoS protection, it's also that soft benefit, right? It's the time productivity. You're not having teams burnt out, right? Burnout in cybersecurity teams is huge, they, especially during COVID when everybody not only went all cloud, all remote, they had all that, but then they're trying to protect a 300% increase in attacks, right? That's, that's a huge job. So you have team fatigue, you have burnout, you have reputational damage of the IT team or security team internally. And then in terms of the other side, which is the business side, um, is that reputational uh, damage and brand damage. And look, a lot of cyber professionals I've talked to kind of roll their eyes, right? And say, well, you know, they'll, we still use XYZ product after an attack. And I said, absolutely, for sure. But if you, you know, look at the numbers, right? Bandwidth.com, $12 million in a year, potentially impacted of revenue. I also tell some of my IT leaders I've talked to, if their board isn't totally on board with the impact, show them some of the emails, the blog posts, the video, let's say, of the CEO after 24, 48 hours of an attack, how exhausted and how much they're apologizing to their customer base for it. So again, there's some really soft uh, impacts, but also, you know, benefits and, and costs to be considered. So. I do want to make sure that um, that last slide that you shared doesn't um, go by too quickly and that we would encourage everybody to reach out and engage. Um, it's pretty straightforward. Uh, <laughs> and get a demo of, of solutions like Cloudflare. Um, uh, we're at Solutions Review, we're a big fan of uh, encouraging engagement. Um, just as a matter of of learning, I mean, it, you know, you shouldn't be thinking about it as you know this this kind of sales cycle that you're going to be entering into. It's really, it's as much an opportunity for you to understand where you have um, issues and where you may have um, some weaknesses and 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 be vulnerable to threats uh, as anything. So, by all means, we would encourage everybody to to uh, request the demo and engage, but. With regard to that, Kim, mm -hmm. I'm curious uh, if you can talk to how that might go. I mean, what can somebody expect as they begin to reach out and engage with Cloudflare? Yeah, I think, you know, one thing that's, that's really stood out to me, first of all, like I said at the beginning, is the approach that we take. Um, I've been in security a long time. Look, I've even uh, sold and launched some of those platforms that offer that false efficiency, right? Um, and so I, I think it's just a really interesting and unique way that we approach it because of the network footprint we have. We've built that up since the company's inception. And so um, it's something that really differentiates us. And when you start having a global perspective of threats and attacks and data, that's extremely powerful for being able to stay ahead of the curve and, and ahead of the threats. If you don't want to talk to sales, you want a cool site to go kind of poke around on, see what data we see. Uh, Radar on cloudflare.com is a great site. Um, that will actually show you just how many DDoS attacks we're seeing right now in the past seven days, past year, um, but incredible information. Um, and again, I think you know our Cloudflare team is really great that we believe that you should be able to onboard and adopt things as you need them and very quickly and easily. So that's been something that um, I've enjoyed is you can start out with maybe trying out some of these services, trying out some DDoS uh, protection, maybe bot management, um, some areas of these, these network security solutions even. Um, and then you can easily continue to expand and onboard new services as you wanna improve security and also just continuously lower down that complexity and total cost. So again, very soft approach, um, very nice you know, kind of onboarding and easily adopted. So, uh, you know, again, um... From our perspective here at Solutions Review, the, this this sort of thing is not a nice to have. It's a have to have, and we make a very specific distinction around that uh, just for enterprise technology solutions. And and I don't think there's any question that um, that this isn't going to become less complex a world uh, going forward. And these uh, attacks are not going to be. Um, 
simplified and and uh, and less sophisticated. So honestly, I mean, what we already can face and uh, what you're mitigating right now, I think, uh, needs to be recognized as um, the the base level at this point of what's coming. So tell me, um, because we we do have some questions coming in. Uh, one is, uh, what's the limit of uh, DDoS attacks that you will that you allow mitigation for? Yeah, that's a that's an easy answer, and and one we're happy about is we always offer unmetered attack detect or protection. So there is no a limit or um, hard fast limits that you see. Um, I think that question comes out a lot too. We see hardware appliances, for example, that do have hard limits on capacity. So, um, yeah, we have for unmetered attack protection. And so, you know, you're, you've you've been in the industry for a while. You've been at different solutions. Um, you have, uh, I think, an interesting perspective in general outside of just the Cloudflare perspective. I'm curious where you see traction right now with uh, with this higher level of. Uh, of protection. I mean, where, 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 what kind of companies are are looking for this sort of thing? Um, you mentioned a few uh, of your clients, but I'm curious, industries or uh, I don't know, size of companies. Where are you seeing uh, a demand? Yeah, no, that's a, a great question. So, um, look, you you go back maybe five, eight years. I would I would give you a more specific answer. Um, <laughs> But nowadays, I'd say just about everybody, right, is is a target, and we, and we know that. Um, I will say that we have a lot of customers out of millions of our customers. Most of them are free customers, actually. Um, so one thing I would encourage everybody, whether you're a small, medium-sized business, all the way up to a large enterprise, um, that you definitely consider looking at some of the free options that are out there, um, some of the free services we have to just start protecting yourselves more. Um, in terms of advanced DDoS or where we see people really double down in protection is definitely dependent upon how much a disruption is going to cost and directly impact revenue. Um, you saw things like uh, voice over IP uh, vendors, retail providers, um, gaming right industry, things like that are sometimes more targeted. So they'll double down on the investment. Um, but most customers we talk to actually go with our core services, which is uh, and the security side, especially on the DDoS protection. Yeah, I, I, the statistic I used at the outset of, uh, is it 14 billion, 140 billion? 140 billion in tax, is that what you're looking at? <laughs> that was, that was a, a magnitude low. Um, <laughs> it's shocking. It's absolutely it shocking. Uh, it it, it's almost impossible to comprehend. Um, yeah. Those numbers are so humongous. and and. Uh, and so can you talk about that? Is that is that um, is that on the rise? I mean, is that you guys are just just kind of continually calculating this and and I, I'm blown away by those numbers. <laughs> it is. You know, I joked up because, um, again, about five, maybe six years ago, I was like the conspiracy theorist of the family and people thought I was kind of crazy about, you know, um, not having Alexa in my house, things like that. Right. Um, and now I'm I'm the go to expert of how to help protect, you know, my mom from phishing attacks. Um, but it's it's amazing to me because I think the thing to remember about these attacks, we're seeing this tremendous volume, which is fantastic. If you can't see it, right, you can't mitigate it, we can see it. Um, but I think the other thing to remember is that these attacks are run now by uh, organizations and people that are in business to do this. That's the biggest shift that I've seen. And, and not only the volume, yes, there's been volume of attack increase. We've seen it with DDoS, 103% quarter over quarter in the three hour attacks. We saw 300% increase in ransomware, right, over the, the COVID period. And I believe that continues to rise. Um, phishing attacks continue to lead the charge. But I think the difference that I've seen over the years is it's gone from hackers, right? Uh, you know, what we think of as maybe an individual or somebody just trying to test out if they can be malicious to these organizations for hire. Um, organizations that have marketing departments, that have sales, that have websites where you can go purchase your attack, right? So again, I think it's the sophistication um, as well as just the sheer volume that they can do that. Yeah, it's it's, it's amazing. And, and that idea that, that, you know, there's basically, a, I mean, Maybe we should have a category at Solutions Review around, you know, just the DDoS uh, 
solution providers <laughs> or the DDoS attack providers. <laughs> well, it's unbelievable. Yeah, and, and, yeah, and now, <laughs> so the scary part now is they're combining attacks. So they do DDoS, for example, to kind of mask or disrupt while they infiltrate with ransomware. So like now you're looking, you know, it's it's become a an expert game, right, at, at doing this. And so I always describe to people, imagine crimes, you know, back in Wild West, and we're just starting to build up kind of our law enforcement, our tools, our defenses. Um, but I think the other factor that we have to consider is that everywhere business, right? We went from four walls, building network, our, our network in general fundamentally changed in terms of where it needs to go. And a lot of times the public internet is now where our companies are. So it's just a, it's a, it's a great perfect storm as, as cliche as that, <laughs> that analogy is well, of all I, I, these things coming together. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, and I joke about it, but, it, but truth of the matter is there's the, and, and, uh, and we've had moments at solutions review, there's nothing more debilitating, um, for the human psyche, uh, than when you can't work, <laughs> you know, right. when things aren't working. Okay. Um, and, uh, and so, you know, I think that, I, I think that cost that you mentioned of, of, uh, client retention, um, mm -hmm. in that slide is one that, um, you may be underestimating because really it, it's incredibly damaging when, um, it, not only to, to clients, but to morale and everything, when you feel like, you know, you can't get, you can't get your job done. You know, you're under a lot of pressure to produce as a as an employee in an organization, and all of a sudden you're not able to do that because, for whatever reason in the organization, um, the protection wasn't quite there. And I, I don't think anybody um, truly understands the protection, the value of protection until it's no longer there. Right. Uh, or we have so there's um, a statistic out there about 11 percent of employees are uh, considering leaving their company because of the tech experience that they have because of technology. And so it's it's usually one of two things when they don't feel safe, right? They have the attack happen, but also the blocking to productivity that that has, right? That latency, um, things like trying to make them go through hoops and hurdles of security uh, in general is, is just getting in the way. Um, and people are tired of not having the resources to be able to do their jobs. So it's it's a direct impact in the world we live in today. It's like not giving a new hire a desk you know, like they don't have a good experience technology wise. Well, that's right. Or giving yeah. them a, a desktop, right? And 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 asking them to work from home or work on the road. I mean, you just can't get your yeah. job done when you're when can't you're do it. Uh, yeah. So so again, I think um, we at Solutions Review love presentations like this and we love talking to folks like Kim and Cloudflare because ultimately um, we're, we're, we're enthusiastic proponents of the latest and greatest solution sets and, and the great value that we get out of covering enterprise technology is that we get to talk about companies that are, that are really doing some really excellent work and doing things at, a, at an incredibly um, high level. Uh, and so we would encourage you to, to, to reach out and, uh, and engage Cloudflare to find out everything that they're bringing to the table uh, it's an impressive organization, an impressive solution, uh, and we're thrilled that we were able to have you on. Um, sure. Kim, you're you're uh, a great guest, and this has been a great conversation. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. And again, I hope everybody takes a moment, reach out to me on LinkedIn too if you have any questions. But thanks for having me, Doug. I appreciate it. Yeah, and we'll we'll make sure that this is all uh, all uh, recorded and placed. Uh, quite visibly on our site and, uh, and across all of our social media, and I know Cloudflare will as well. Uh, so Kim, uh, best of luck for the rest of the year, uh, and certainly best of luck with, uh, with your role at Cloudflare, and thanks very much for your time today. Great, thank you, Doug, appreciate it. Have a good one. So there you have it, another solution in our spotlight. We wanna thank Cloudflare for being a part of this event, and Kimberly for that fine presentation. And we appreciate your participation as well. Until next time, I'm Doug Atkinson here at Solutions Review. Thanks for watching.